All right, good morning, good morning, welcome here this morning, welcome to um, everyone here in Breakthrough City Church. Um, um, we just had just such an amazing time of worship. Welcome to Courtney. We are praying for you and everyone else also listening. We trust him for miracles and healings. God is good. And in all circumstances, he remains good and he remains faithful. Um, also, for those who are going to listen online later in that, uh, also greetings there to Tina and Chad um, and um, the folks in Lesotho and those people in Switzerland and other places listening. Welcome here this morning. Um, <clears throat> I want to just continue. We've been sharing about... Um, um, the thing about holiness and what holiness is. We shared a few weeks ago about worship, what worship is, and we shared about um, just the thing really of holiness. And I touched on and I ended off last week, and I want to just jump into that this morning, um, about uh, the fear of God. And when I spoke about holiness, we had this, this thing about where there's this religious uh, aspect where people... You know, it's a bunch of rules and regulations and that. Um, but I, I really uh, believe and that what God is really just doing on planet Earth now is really just bringing where the fear of God will come in. Um, not just into the church, but into the workplace, into the schools, the universities, the Olympic Games, politics, everywhere. But you know what? God first starts with his house, starts with his body. The house of God is the dwelling place of God. That is, corporatively, every local house. God is busy with the church right now. And um, I just want to share scripture, which uh, I want to just kick off here quickly with you. is in Hebrews 12. Um, I just want to touch uh, one or two things quickly before I continue. So it's in verse 12, verse 12, it says, Therefore strengthen the hands which hang down and feeble knees. So whatever you might be experiencing, you might experience a weakness in your life at the moment and that it speaks about we need to be strengthened and when we're not strengthened, we stumble. And if we are part of the body and function in part of the body, we become strong. Remember I shared an encounter night a few weeks ago when the way we, one says I'm weak, the other one says I'm strong. There's, a, there's a, um, a burden which we carry with one another. So when one is affected, the other is affected. That's why even sexual sin affects the local church even. That's the thing I won't speak about today specifically, but there's certain things in the body that we can actually draw from one another. There's a grace in your life that I need. Submit one to another. All right, so there's a submission in and we actually get strength from one another. We need one another. And so important to understand the local church and the body because we are a body. We're the body of Christ. So it says, strengthen your uh, hands and, uh, which hang down on your feeble knees. Then it says, and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but rather healed. Um, there's so many what I experienced Christians that have dis dislocated something in their lives. And, and are, are actually stumbling. And I believe God wants to give strength to the body again. But the dislocations many times happens because of a pattern and a way of life that we live in. And I'm going to try to get this message finished today because there's some really some nuggets, gold nuggets, that I believe God wants us to actually take hold of this morning. Um, I believe that will transform your life. Um, it goes on, verse 14, pursue peace with all people and, and holiness without which no one will see God. And remember we spoke about what holiness is. There's a positional holiness. When we got saved, we positionally in Christ we're holy. But there's a behavioral holiness that I don't go and, uh, since I'm married and have a wife, I don't go uh, mess around, sleep around with other ladies, and my wife doesn't do that with other men. 
So there is some, there's a behavioral holiness that we have to pursue as Christians. And this is one of the things pretty much because the message of the kingdom was never always preached in churches and even still today, but the message of salvation, which only handles giving your life to Jesus and going to heaven, but it doesn't handle the thing of becoming more like Christ. Becoming, Paul says, I labor until Christ is formed in you. And that is part of discipleship. That is part of walking a path with someone, and we grow in Christ-likeness. So there's a behavioral way as Christians we need to behave. It's not about going to heaven. It's about the way we represent heaven. Yeah. On earth as it is in heaven. And, um, and then it says, verse 15, looking carefully lest anyone fall short. It says fall short. I don't know what your Bible says. Did you just... This is, this is where the hyper grace came in, is if you've saved, uh, grace just saved you and that's it. You can do what you want. That is where the corruption and deception came, has come into the church. That grace just keeps you there. We must be careful with that. I shared with you last week, and I'll just touch on that again, what happened to Ananias and Sapphira in the New Testament. Um, and here is this, Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. This is speaking to the church. That we become defiled. So you can be part of a church, part of a network, part of pastors, leaders, elders, whatever, prophets, teachers, apostles, doesn't matter. But you can become defiled. And there's a lot of defiling. I really just believe that God, through his love, is wanting to deal and busy dealing with the church. That's why even part of the prophetic word for this year, as um, you know, God is really sifting and dealing with the church right now. Uh, we see what's happened with a lot of ministries, um, leaders and stuff. And I say, yes, it's the grace of God that, that you and I aren't falling into that. So firstly, I'm saying that. I'm not pointing a finger here. Um, um, and it says, verse 16, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who was one morsel, uh, uh, Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. There's something that you now might desire more, that we actually sell what we've, what's been purchased for us. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. You, you do realize this is the New Testament I'm referring to here. I don't know what Bible you have, but this is in the New Testament. Carries on, goes about Moses, and um, I'm actually be referring to some of these scriptures about uh, Moses and the mountain. And, um, and then verse 22 says, But... You have come to Mount Zion. Now, Mount Zion is a spiritual dimension of the church. That's the church, this Mount Zion. And you've come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. Then it says this, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. The local church is where our spirit man, this is where we've been configured. This is where God is working in us. Because we are in Christ. We are seated in Christ, even though we're physically here. That's what the word says. This heavenly Jerusalem, and that also affects, we are part of that. On earth as is in heaven, because Christ is seated. Jesus is on the right hand of the Father, but he's also, his spirit is within us. We are in Christ, but we're physically on this earth. So this is, we are part of this assembly. This is where God is dealing with us. He's configuring our spirit. We come into this place uh, of, of maturity in Christ-likeness. That's why we can experience what is there here. All right. So now coming just back to this about that... Um, about the fear of God. So I just took a slight detour there and that. Just coming back to this here. So without holiness, 
we cannot see God. So a lot of Christians, remember what I said to you, I think it was last week or previous, I said 23 million, uh, according to a study in America, 23 million people have left the faith, no longer serving Jesus, become atheists, spiritists, agnostics. That's a study done by, by Barna. Um, and I shared a lot of those facts. I don't know about the rest of the world, but, um, and the main conclusion came is because people no longer will experience the presence of God. So my question is, if you've given your life to Jesus, do you experience God's presence now? Because if you're not, you have to go back to the drawing board and see what has caused you to stumble. What misjointedness has come in your life, what I just read now. Because, uh, uh, because of injury, because of hurt, pain, offense, don't let any root of bitterness, as I just read. These are the things that cause people to become just disjointed, and you actually stumble, and we actually miss the mark of what God wants to do in our lives. And we don't experience that, what he has for us. So, now, the thing is this, one of the remedies for what God is doing right now, and for you and me, each one of us, is the fear of God. And I touched on last week, what is the fear of God? Um... There, um, do you know that there's a healthy fear of God? So what is the fear of God? The fear of the Lord is not to be scared of God. Just understand what I'm saying. The fear of the Lord is not to be scared of God. Okay. The, the, the scripture I referred to last week was that the fear of the Lord is God's treasure. Remember I referred to it last week. The fear of the Lord is God's treasure. So... What happened with Moses? Um, when Moses brought Israel out of Egypt, where were they going? I say again, when Moses brought Israel out of Egypt, where were they going? They weren't going to the promised land. Five times, God tells Pharaoh, let my people go. Let them leave Egypt for what? To go worship me. Let my people go so that my people can come and worship me. That's what God said to Moses. So they were not going to the promised land according that they, this Moses said, let my people go. Because I want, God said, they must come worship me. So, let my people go that they might worship me in the wilderness. So, why would God actually want to bring them to the promised land? Why would God want to bring them to the promised land? Before, he would bring them to the promiser. I say again, why would God want to bring them to the promised land before he would bring them to the promiser? You see, the thing is, if you bring them to the promised land before the promiser, you will make the promised land into a place of idolatry. So just step back. If you've heard the message of salvation, not the message of the kingdom, of which salvation is a facet, a lot of Christians have been seeking the benefits of the kingdom and not the king of the kingdom. And when you and I look for the benefits of the kingdom and not the king in the kingdom, we actually, as Christians, have idolatry in what we seek and in life. Are you with me? You still there? Do you know that uh, Israel was abused by Pharaoh? I mean, he was, they were so misused by Pharaoh and they were busy making someone else rich and wealthy because of all the work that they were busy with in Egypt. Um, and then they say, let's go back to Egypt. Because it was actually more comfortable in some way. Do you know that... Um, Moses was actually raised as a prince in Pharaoh's 
house and at war palace. So Pharaoh, so Moses is raised up in a very wealthy setup. And he had everything he wanted. But what Moses does, he leaves Egypt. And when he leaves Egypt, he never says it was better in Egypt. He never says it. The Israelites did. Why was that? Because Moses had one encounter with God in a fiery bush. And Moses wanted Israel to have the same experience. Remember what I spoke about Jesus? Uh, about two weeks ago I said that the word of God says, Jesus says, I will manifest myself to you if you keep my commands. If you keep what I'm, I'm, I've said to you, I will manifest. I will reveal myself to you. My presence, what you long for, what you desire is what you will find. So if we not experience God's presence, are we actually busy following his commands? So yes, Moses, he wants Israel to also encounter the living God in this fiery bush. In Exodus 19, we see that Moses goes up onto Mount Sinai and he meets with God. And God tells Moses, he, God tells Moses, he says, go down to these Israelites and what I want you to do, go tell them, my people, the whole reason that I brought you out of Egypt was actually to bring you to me. So he tells, he tells Moses, he says, Moses, go tell my people. The reason why they were brought out of Egypt was not to take them to the promised land, was to bring them to me. Why? Because God says, he says, I've actually, his desire was that everyone would become a kingdom of priests, not just a few. But everyone would be priests, meaning that you could approach God as a priest. New Testament says now we are a kingdom of priests and prophets, all of us who are born again. We have access to approach the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. All right? We can personally approach God. That was the desire of God and it was a desire of Moses. So... God tells Moses, he says further on, he says, listen, get ready, wash your clothes, basically get the filth of Egypt off you, get prepared, because I'm coming down, and before, listen to me, before I reveal myself as a loving God, listen to me carefully, before I reveal myself as a loving God, I will be revealing myself as a holy God. I had someone comment on a post I put on my Facebook, I think, yesterday because of something that happened at the Olympic Games. And um, I put it in a nice way, and it's almost like a Christian. Um, and the, the thing was that, you know, yes, these people are doing these perverse things and whatever, whatever, but we need to just love them and you need to just whatever. Let me tell you something. Do not mock God. Do not think because the loving God, He is a loving God. Jesus loved us, therefore gave His life, yes. But you must also understand, God is holy. And I say again, what God was doing before, um, um, before He wanted to reveal Himself as a loving God, He wanted to reveal Himself as as a holy God. Because in the center of holiness is love. In the center of his holiness is love. So before God came down from the mountain, what happened? The people ran from God. Why? Why? Because they had still too much of Egypt left. Egypt left. In themselves. Exodus 20:20. 20, 20. Moses is confused at their response. You, you, you know, he's confused at their response. And, and then it says, 
Do not fear. Listen to me. This is important. Do not fear because God has come to test you. All right. To see, God wants to test you. Why? To see if his fear is in you so that you may not sin. All right. So what happens is, yes, Moses, Moses is differentiating, differentiating between being scared of God and the fear of the Lord. What is the difference? I'm glad you asked me. What is the difference between the fear of God and fearing God? The person who is scared of God always has something to hide. Did you hear that? The person who is scared of God has something to hide. What happened with Adam when he sinned? He went and hid from the presence of God. So, the person who fears God has nothing to hide. Therefore, you don't have to run. He or she who fears God is actually terrified of being away from God. That's the fear of God. You're terrified from being away from God. So the definition of fear of the fear of God, the definition of the fear of God is the following. It is to be terrified of being away from him. In Proverbs 16:6, 6, Proverbs 16:6, 6, it says, By the fear of the Lord. One departs from evil. So you understand that even in the church, in the body, there's a lot of the fear of the Lord that is not there because there's a lot of people that are doing evil that are in the church, that are born again. The fear of the Lord is to depart from evil. There was a, a, a well-known who remembers books being written, the guy in America called Jim Baker. He was a televangelist. Uh, remember years ago, you remember? And um, for what he did is he was in adulterous relationships for seven years and he committed fraud through certain postal um, fraud that he d committed in those years when, they, when the post services worked. So um, what happened was... Um, he, he, he was in an interview and, and um, so he was, he was put in prison because of that. And um, he was interviewed and basically what he said was the following. Um, a question was put, at what point did you fall out of love with God? And I want to say this to each one of you, those online, each one of you. I'm going to try and get your eyes and look the folks' eyes in your line. At what point did you fall out of love with Jesus? And he made the following statement. He said, he did not fall out of love with Jesus. Even after all this fraud and after all this uh, adultery. But what he did say, he said, I did not fear God. I still love Jesus. But I did not fear God. There's a lot of habits, a lot of things that are happening in the body of Christ. Where we love the Lord Jesus. But we've lost the fear of God. Because we're doing things. And if we knew God was involved in this, we would run. Because we know God would not sanction whatever we're doing so what he said was he actually made a comment he said there's many believers that love Jesus but they don't fear the Lord that's a dangerous place to be 
That's why I say you can be heading up churches, you can be pastors, leaders, head, it up, head up ministries, you can be in business, top in your business, you can be whatever. You can love Jesus, but if you don't have the fear of God, you will do things that affects that presence of God, that intimacy that you desire. Because he's the one and only can fulfill it. So it is by the fear of the Lord that one departs from evil. When you fear the Lord, you depart from the wrong habits, the wrong thinking, the wrong things in your internal life. What is the fear of the Lord? The fear of the Lord is to fear God is to be in awe of Him. It is to honor. It is to tremble. It is to revere. It is to esteem. It is to respect. It is to value. It is to venerate Him more than anything or anyone else. It is, that is what the fear of God is. So when someone fears God, he will love what God loves. And he will hate what God hates. Hello? What's the legalistic fear of the Lord? The legalistic fear of the Lord is, I fear God, that's why I hate those sinners. Do you hear what I said? The legalistic fear of the Lord. So yes, we saw certain things happen with the Olympic opening and was really just, just whatever. But the legalistic side, and, and someone overreacted on comments on my Facebook, Christian, because the thing is, the legalistic thing is, I, I fear God and that's why I hate those sinners. That's legalistic and that's religion. Remember, God loves sinners. But he hates the sin that unmakes that person. He hates the sin that disrupts the person. Hebrews 1 verse 9, Hebrews 1 verse 9. Because you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness, therefore God, your God, has anointed you more than your companions. Do you know that when you, when you learn to hate sin, because God hates sin, what actually also happens in your life, anointing will increase in your life. Remember what I said, praying for people, and you, Lord, why doesn't this happen? Why doesn't the healing happen? Why doesn't that happen? Sometimes it's not God's side, the problem. It's sometimes I have to go sort out, okay, what's in my life? What, what is happening here? What, what introspection do I do? What things do I have to check up? Whatever. But when, when you actually hate what God hates, and you don't allow that, actually anointing increases in your life, because that's what the word says there in Hebrews. So what is the fear of God? It is awe. The awe of God. What is it? The, I'll give you just a couple of points. It is to tremble at His presence. It is to tremble at His presence. The other thing is, I'll get to that now. The other point, what does it mean to the fear of God? Is tremble, to tremble at His word. One is to tremble at his presence, and the other one is to tremble at his word. We'll get into that now. So, the first one is in Psalm 89, verse 7. Psalm 89, verse 7. God is great, greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints, and to be held in reverence by all those around him. So, by all those who surround him, okay? Okay. Do you know that, um, that you will not find God in an atmosphere where he is not held in utmost respect? When that happens, his manifest presence starts breaking out. So you can be in the streets, whatever, and because of your utmost awe and respect of him, 
the presence of God breaks out even there. Because you and I are the light. All right? His manifest breaks out like that. So manifest presence means what? Manifest presence means manifesting from the unseen to the seen realm. Manifest presence means God's presence manifests from the unseen to the seen realm. What is omnipresence? Omnipresence is God says, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. Manifest presence from the unseen to the present. Presence uh, um, reality is what, what his, his manifest presence does. Okay, so... Many times I've seen this before. We, we, I'm telling you, we don't know the awe of God. Like, you know, sometimes people are eating and drinking and stuff in the worship times or sessions together, whatever. We, we sometimes don't know how to respond in His presence because we've never learned it at home anyway. It's called manners. It's called when there's certain things of how responding to someone. If, if, you're, if the president comes in here, it's not we're going to sit chewing gum. There's a thing of certain honor and respect. doesn't matter what we think of how he does whatever things. That there is a certain thing of respect that we need to have. So God will never manifest himself where he is not held with utmost respect. He's not your buddy. Hey, you know. No, no. And I touched on that about Ananias and Sapphira. Remember last week I spoke about it. So, um, can I say this? In God's presence, you are petrified. But you're drawn to. I say it again. In God's presence, you and I are petrified. But we're drawn to it. And Ananias and Sapphira were in such presence with the Apostle Peter and that, that they actually dropped dead. It is the awe, the reverence. It is holy fear. It's not the religious stuff, please. Because I touched on that last, we actually won't get there this morning. Uh, there's a whole section I wanted to give you about in his presence is fullness of joy. So please, we're not Christians sucking lemons. They're good. These faces we're pulling. No, no, no. In his presence there's joy. But I, I, can, I can have joy and laughter and joy. And in it, but there's still an awe of who he is. Do you understand what I'm saying? All right. The fear of the Lord, listen to me, is clean. Enduring forever. Psalm 19 verse 9. Psalm 19 verse 9 says this. The fear of the Lord is clean Important word, next one. Enduring forever. The fear of the Lord is clean. Enduring forever. Key word there, I'll give to you now what it means. What happened? We know that Lucifer used to lead worship in heaven before the throne of God. Do you know that Lucifer did not have the fear of God? He did not endure forever. But you get what I just said. Psalm 19 verse 9 says, The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Lucifer did not have the fear of the Lord, even though he was in the glory. Therefore, he never endured forever. Even in the church, the glory, there's how many people? You might have experienced personally also the glory of the Lord. It's, it's, the glory is his face. It's, it's where I choose to want to actually live. We call to live there. Um, but this scripture speaks about the fear of the Lord. He's clean, endures forever. So now, we also see one third of the angels that were with, with old Nick, and with Lucifer. Uh, and they also fell. Why? They fell from being in the glory. I mean, guys, come on. How's it? You're in the absolute glory of God and you still fall away. How's it possible? It is possible. Why? Even a third of the angels. Why? Because they did not fear God. 
they did not endure forever. Adam and Eve walked in the presence of God, in the coolness of the day. They walked in the glory, but they did not fear God. They did not endure forever. Some of the people that I've read about autobiographies as well, that have actually had such encounters that are affected in my life, just reading, I'll say, oh, Lord, I've been so long for this. And you year later, they've, they've, they, they've encountered God in the glory, and then you just hear the, years later, their life, how it's just things have fallen away. How is it possible? Because of this. All right? Because they did not endure forever everyone will stand before the throne one day so and for eternity will be tested for the fear of god do you know that many pastors many leaders started with the fire of god but did not endure why they lacked holy fear and this is the danger, just hear me right, even as Christians, there's, there's amazing, and like I said, this is what I long for, is His glory, His presence. But you can't stay there, you have, there's a new encounter we have from, for, of Him, that's why holy, holy, there's a new revelation of who He is. But the, having the fear of the Lord is that I do not desire something that will separate me from Him. I will hate what He hates. The second aspect of the fear, um, the second aspect of holy fear is what? Is to tremble at his word. To tremble at his word. What does that mean? Isaiah 66 verse 2. Isaiah 66 verse 2. It says the following. This is the one whom I will look. He or she who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Now, it actually means to place close attention to what God is saying. He's saying, God is saying to Israel, you're busy with all your offerings, um, but all your offerings, what you're busy doing, is like offering me pig's blood. Remember, you couldn't offer pigs, it was goats and lambs, you know. It's like offering me pigs. And um, so God says, listen, I pay attention to him who is what? Who is humble and contrite in spirit and who trembles at my word. Well, what does it mean to tremble at God's word? What does it mean to tremble at God's word? It means to Im obey Him immediately. When you hear the Word of God and you don't obey immediately, you're not trembling at the Word of God. So, giving, I mean, a, a little example. Um, when I heard, when I got saved, I think it was two weeks later in that, um, and the guy discipling me, you know, said to me, you know, when you give your life to the Lord, you must, you know, get baptized. He says, oh, must I get baptized? Yes, yes, the Word says. I say, fine, let me get baptized. And I was baptized in this two weeks afterwards. After I got saved, I mean. I was basically looking for the first opportunity. It was in the month of May in the Freeze State, in the Free State, our province, and I was baptized. And there I had such an amazing encounter as part of a testimony in my life. But what does it mean to tremble at God's word? It means to obey Him immediately. Um, when someone says, you know, God is speaking to me in months about I need to sort this out. You're actually boasting about the lack of fear in your life. People say, no, God's speaking to me. You know, I need to deal with it in my life now, for months now. You don't fear. You don't tremble at the word of God. That's what you're actually saying. What does it mean to tremble at, God, to tremble at God's word? Obey him even if it doesn't make sense. Obey him even if it doesn't make sense. Do you know that you obey him even if it hurts? There's things that God has said to me, to you maybe, 
that when he says, okay, you need to do this, you need to give this, you need to do that, obey him immediately. Even though it doesn't make sense. And it also hurts. I, won't, I haven't got time to give examples, but all of us will have examples where God said do this, and it maybe financially hurts you, or it maybe hurts your pride. Or, do you understand? But do that immediately. All right. Right. Um, what does it mean to, uh, to, uh, to, to tremble at God's word? Um, obey him even if we don't see the benefit. Obey God even when you don't see the benefit. Because we always have that agenda. Why? <laughs> but obey him even if it doesn't make sense. Do you know that uh, Esther... She, um, she didn't see the benefit where she actually went before the king. She, her life depended on that. She, she, he could have just said, okay, roll the head, chop her head off or whatever. But she didn't see the benefit of when God said go before the king. But we know the result. Why do people walk away from God? Why is it that people walk away from God? Many times we try to get people saved and to join the church instead of actually to repent. Ah, oh, just give your life to Jesus. Oh, fine. No, no, that's one part. Now that you've given your life to Jesus, this is what you've got to walk out. And I'll get to that now because now something happens inside you that you need to walk with God so he can work in you. So do we, do we think Jesus is, is coming back for a bride uh, who still wants to take part in the world? No, he's coming for a bride without blemish, without wrinkle. Isn't that so? All right. The next point in that, under that is, what does to tremble at his word means what? To obey all the way to completion. To obey all the way to completion. So what's the greatest uh, promise of God to you and me? What's the greatest promise of God to you and me? Friendship. That's what he's promised, friendship. From the start with Israel, all he wanted was friendship. And we're looking for the benefits. He just wants friendship. Psalm 25 verse 14. Psalm 25 verse 14. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him, and he will show them his covenant. Check these words out. Psalm 25 verse 14. Listen to this. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. And he will show them his covenant. God wants to show you and me secrets. And it's just sometimes just for you and me. It's not necessarily for other people. But he wants to show us secrets. Who knows there's good secrets and bad secrets? All right? Isn't that so? But God says, I want to share my secrets with those who fear me. People say, yeah, but I just don't know much. I don't know anything. God wants to share secrets with you and me. Who knows that you don't share your secrets with everyone except those who are intimate and close to you. Isn't that so? That's what God does. So people say, yeah, but I don't really know this. I mean, I asked a stupid question. For some people might think that, but I think it was a good question. And, and I'll share this because I have shared it before, like little secrets. I mean, it's just a thing. And they asked one day, I mean, split second, just like that. Just like that. It wasn't, oh, Lord, I'm going to go fast and pray for the, what you're telling me. Um, since I know Candace isn't here at the moment, but she's normally alarmed when it comes to if a spider is found in the house or any premises. She's the alarm system. You can get her and we rent her out. So they normally come there. In Africa, we have the nice big rain spiders and that and whatever they come. But the one day I was just saying, Lord, you know, I was saying, because, you know, I know all of you love spiders. <laughs> I said, Lord, you know why? You know why did you make the spider? It's it's not the prettiest. <laughs> and just like that, Lord said to me, He says, because I've designed that so that your engineers can actually design things because of how I've created this spider. 
And not just long after that, I heard about robotic things that were actually made functional because of how spiders function with the eight legs, as well as their webs and stuff. How pe We've learned from that, animals. And I thought, wow, okay, just like a boom, just straight away. Immediately, I said, Lord, why? I was just walking, Lord. And those are the secrets. And this is, that might seem simple to you, but it was profound for me. You know, I thought, why this ugly thing? I didn't ask the Lord about you, but no, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. All right, so God shares his secrets, okay? Um, and Psalm 25, verse 14. Psalm 25, verse 14. Friendship with the Lord is reserved. Listen to me. Friendship with the Lord is reserved for those who fear him. Then he shares his secrets. Psalm 25 verse 14. Friendship with the Lord is reserved for those who fear him. With, uh, and with them he shares his secrets. Do you know that not everyone is God's friend? Who are you? Not everyone is God's friend. It's your choice because the invitation was given already. Jesus makes a statement and he says, you are my friend, John 15. So, you know, many times we write songs about it and we speak about it and we read further the, the following scripture in John 15 verse 14. So we write songs about this, we speak about it in John 15, 14. It says, you are my friends. And what does it say further? Because we don't keep on reading it. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Ah. Oh. Well, are you doing what he's commanding you? That's part of the fear of the Lord. That's why Abram was a friend of God. Why was Abram a friend of God? You know, God goes, tells Abram, listen, I want you to go and worship me. Take your son. He goes three days, takes Isaac, the promise, which he waited for so long, and he picks up the, the knife and to, to actually sacrifice and to um, st kill his son, the sacrifice. And God says, stop. What does God say? Now I know you fear me. Now I know you fear me. That's why Abram is called a friend of God. Because he followed his command. You are a friend because you obeyed instantly when it did not make sense. It doesn't always make sense. You obeyed God when it didn't benefit you. Abram lifts his eyes and he says, Jehovah Jireh, my God has provided. What did God do? God, this is the first time he reveals part of his personality right there to Abram. The secrets of God. No one had known this before. This is the first time Abram finds out a secret of God, which we know about now. God even said, he said, um, he said to Abram, remember uh, with Sodom and Gomorrah, before he destroys Sodom and Gomorrah, the two angels, and he speaks about also the angel of the Lord, they actually speak and they said, should we actually tell Abram what we're about to do? Do you know that God wants you and I to speak to him about even the counsel of what must happen with world history. And he wants to tell us of things. And then he's, then uh, God said, you know, because Abram, you know, he shares with Abram about Sodom and Gomorrah and um, um, then, you know, Abram says, will you destroy Sodom and Gomorrah if there's not 50 righteous? And he goes down and he goes, will you destroy Sodom and Gomorrah if there's not 10 righteous? Because you, you do realize Sodom and Gomorrah was a booming business 24 hours before it was destroyed. It was a booming business 24 hours before it was destroyed. It was, at, and, and, I mean, so 
in, uh, you can have a look in 2 Peter 1, but it says there that Lot was righteous. Listen to me carefully. It says here, yeah, Lot was righteous. But Lot didn't know that destruction was coming. I don't know if you're getting yet what I'm busy telling you. So in today's terms, let's just say in today's terms, he was born again. But he was clueless about destruction coming tomorrow. It takes these two angels in God's mercy when Abram prayed, all right, to get them out. So in today's terms, Lot, if he was born again, he was actually clueless of God's plans. Ah. There are many Christians, are born again, spirit-filled, that don't know the secrets of God, and yet that's the heart of the Father. They are clueless about what God wants to do. But Abram knew the secrets of God. Why? Because he feared God. Many Christians are born again spirit-filled, but because they're not having the fear of God, they're clueless of what God wants to do in their future and in the present. That's a scary place, realizing that. That we have access to all things according to the promises of God. But because we don't have the fear of God, we don't see it or know it. We don't know the seasons of God. Abram knew the secrets of God because he feared God. God said, you're my friend if you do whatever I command you. John 15 verse 14. I'm going to just end with just one or two things. How is it that someone can sit in church for 20 years and end up in bed with another man's wife or another man's husband? How is it possible? Because it happens. No fear of God in their lives. The scripture says, the fear of the Lord is God's treasure. Paul says the following, you, can, you know the scripture in Philippians 2 verse 12. Paul says, work out your salvation... With fear and trembling. Work out your salvation as Christ is working in you and me. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. The fear of God is coming back to the church on planet earth. The fear of God is coming back to our businesses. The fear of God is coming back to our families. The fear of God is coming back to Olympic Games. The fear of God is coming back to politics. Why? Because the church is starting to walk into those arenas. And where we start walking and we fear and trembling, God, the living God, not from a religious perspective, we will see situations turn around. Because Jesus is coming back for a bride without blemish, without wrinkle. And I really believe, and I said last week this, and I prayed this in last week, is that there is grace being released now to walk and live a holy life, but also to work, walk in fear and trembling. To hate what he hates and to love what he loves. And our inner world and what we carry here, yeah, because we carriers of his presence, 
He dwells now within us. That we're going to see things like we've never seen before as a church, as we come before people. I just saw a, a clip as well. Um, some of you know that even in the Olympics, there's a major thrust. People being led to the Lord, by the way, despite all the negative things. A lot of people being healed, delivered, and saved right now. There, there's a lot of churches, teams are out there, um, and there's testimonies in that where I'm, I've actually seen some of the visuals where even in taxi cabs, the taxi drivers, the presence of God comes there. The people start weeping and giving their lives to Jesus. Because the church has got out the building. Because the fear of God has come into the place. Amen. And we, we honestly need the fear of God in that in our lives. But also wherever we're involved in. Because that's why we carry Holy Spirit. Because He's a Holy, he's a holy God. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. And so Father... We just stand before you this morning, Lord. We stand, um, and I want to pray for those online. Um, I want to pray for those that are sick. Uh, we are already praying for many of you. And Father, I want to pray that just your presence would just go forth and touch lives, that Holy Spirit, you would just bring about a conviction in our lives, that we will choose to live holy, that we will choose to, to um, hate what you hate and to love what you love. And that, Lord, that we would walk righteously before you. That we would walk out of um, the things that have held us down. That we would understand what it is to be friends with you. That we'll know what that friendship is. That you would reveal to us secrets. Even simple things about why did you make the crocodile? Why did you make the spider? Why did you do this? Lord, you've called us into friendship with you. And Father, just draw us in. That we'd have a willing will just to choose to change and to have your fear and to tremble before you. That we will not run from you, but we'd run to you in awe and reverence. Help us to walk in that way, Father. I pray this in Jesus' name for everyone listening to this message. Amen.